This is the examination of the hidden human condition. You're listening to the Hidden Killers Podcast. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. There are consequences to your actions. There are killers that are hidden amongst us in institutions, in places of power, in places where maybe they started out not being a killer, but they sure got there. And beyond being a killer, just individuals who ruined lives, imprisoned parents, had children ripped away from responsible parents who dearly loved their children and were just trying to get them help. One of those fine people is Dr. Sally Smith. Formerly, I shouldn't say formerly, she's actually still listed on the uh, rolls at Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital. She settled out of court in the take care of Maya case. But really, when you really get down to it, the decision she made, the lack of caring, the lack of oversight, the lack of her thinking she could possibly be wrong. She finally kind of admitted to in a note to one of the victims in a totally different case where she screwed up her judgment and imprisoned a father for like 300 days because who knew that one could have the power to do that? Yet she was the voice to authority saying, here's what I think after talking to these people for 10 minutes to 30. How about we base the rest of their child's life on my quick assessment here because I've done more than 3,000 of them and I'm great at this and it's always, but maybe I should look at it. Maybe. Maybe you should be in jail too, Dr. Sally Smith. Maybe that will happen. I don't know. But this is the 911 call, Sally. This is the consequence to your action to not paying enough attention to that family. Where in the end, you cause so much stress and anxiety for a family that the mother ends up taking her own life. Cause and effect. This is from courts. It is heartbreaking. And 100% preventable. Had there been some oversights to Dr. Sally Smith and her choices and lack of good ones. Let's take a listen. How was Beata doing? She was struggling. Um, She was researching a lot about the disease, um, just struggling trying to trying to figure out how to get her baby home. How was your brother doing? Trying to hold the family together. In such an ugly situation, he just, he tried to be the strong, strong one and keep Kyle going and keep Beata on track and just, he, he was struggling. January 8th, 2017, does that date have any significance to you? Yeah, it's my 50th birthday. Can you describe how you woke up that morning? Jack Jack called me and said Beata just hung herself. And uh, he made to get over here right away. Did you you rush over? Yes, immediately. I told my wife Beata hung herself. I'm going to Jack's, and I took off across the street. And you went into the house? Yes. Did you go in through the front door or the garage? Front door. Where was, where was Kyle? Kyle was near the laundry room door, which is just to the right of the front door. And he was trying to get into the garage. Um, Jack was yelling, Kyle, no, you can't go in there. He was trying to keep him back. Um, can I, can I stop you there? Mm-hmm. Your Honor, we'd like to 
at this point publish 2615 and allow the jury the opportunity to listen. Is it, is it in evidence? It is, Your Honor. You may. Yes. Number 8, 2017, set an hour, 57 minutes, and 38 seconds, Sam. 911, what's the location of your emergency? From yourself. What's the address? What city are you in? Venice. Closest road is Lee Road. And Venice. Is there a name to the neighborhood? Kyle. What's the phone number that you call that you're calling from? Uh, I'll give you my cell. Tell me exactly what happened. Uh, she hung herself in the garage. <laughs> no. Stay on the line. Are you with her now? Uh, well, I'm in. I yeah, I'm in the garage. How old is she? 42. <laughs> is she awake? I just no, have to she, verify. She's stiff. She's stiff. She's stiff. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, Kyle, you can't go in there. Okay, tell me why she looks like she's dead. No, she's... No, I'm, I'm a, a retired deputy fire chief. I know she is. Do you think she's beyond any help? Uh, beyond, beyond, yes. Rigging more. I'm sure she's, she's really... Okay. Yeah. I, I'm sending the, the... I'm sending the fire... The, I'm sending someone to assist you. Please leave everything as you found it. I'm is there anything we can do for you? Okay, just please get somebody here. They're on their way. Uh, I'm going to get my... I'm going to bring my son to my neighbor, sir. Call my neighbor. Okay. Can you tell me the address there one more time? Okay, they're on their way. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <clears throat> what did you do with Kyle when you got there? I grabbed Kyle, and I asked Jack if he could call the fire department, and um, just tell them I'm getting Kyle out of here. And I, I scooped up Kyle, and he's just a skinny little boy, and I grabbed him and took him home, and we sat in a chair in my living room for probably six or eight hours crying. Did you see Jack the rest of that day? Oh, I'm sure I did when I brought Kyle back, or I, I don't recall, honestly. Maya was still at Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital? Yes. How long was it after that morning that Maya came home from the hospital? Not long at all. I, I don't remember how many days, but it was it was pretty quick. <coughs> so uh, emotionally, we can all guess how Maya was at that point. Yeah. How was she physically when she came home out of the hospital? She was horrible, horrible. She had been getting so much better, and just to see her going from, you know, in, improving every day to coming home, and her feet were all turned in order, her toes were pointing at each other. Um, again, just looking at her face, the amount of pain in that child. I think it was worse than I had ever seen at that point. So, <clears throat> stepping back and comparing 
Maya physically to where she was in late September, early October of 2016 before she went in the hospital. In January 2017, when she comes out of the hospital, was she better or worse? She was far worse coming out of the hospital. What you, um, what you do to support your brother in the next days and weeks? I closed my shop down and I, I stayed with him. I, th I think I closed my shop probably for a couple months. And I stayed with him every day and helped him with paperwork, cleaning the house, cooking meals, whatever it took, just anything just to be there for him. As um, the Kowalskis grappled with their new life, did you have the opportunity to observe Maya physically rehabilitate herself? <laughs> yeah, and um, she was obvious. She lost her mother, so she was obviously emotionally in a different place. But from a physical standpoint, she's just she's a lot like a mother. She was just very determined, and she was going to work hard. And she wanted out of that wheelchair, and she wanted to walk again. And she worked out constantly through the pain. Uh, I would see her on the on the floor in front of her wheelchair doing exercises um, with tears coming out of her eyes, but she would fight right through it. <laughs> and then uh, one day, after she had finally gotten up on crutches, one day I come over and she's loading up her book bag, not to go to school, but she's putting all kinds of books in her book bag and she put it on her back just to walk down the street to her friend's Riley's house on her crutches. And she wanted that extra weight on her back for exercise and the practice so she can go back to school. She's, she's a tough kid. And I love you, Maya. How about your nephew, Kyle? How'd he do in the six months, year after he lost his mother? Very introverted. Um, I mean, how does any kid do knowing that they're never going to see their mother again? He, he, he struggled. He, um, was very quiet, stayed in his room, didn't interact much with anybody. And um, I think it was, you know, he was trying to grieve internally. And then he eventually, long term, getting to the point where he is now, um, he fishes. That's his outlet. outlet. He likes to fish. Um, it's his place to get away, I think. Maya immersed herself in her school books when she got back to school, and Kyle immersed himself in fishing. <laughs> um, but and, and Jack immersed himself in helping people again. Um, I, I think he, he just, like I said, eventually turned to fishing to have his quiet time and to deal with this. And my last question, um, your brother Jack, how has, how has he changed since losing Beata? He's changed the most, and uh, he hides it the most. He's not as funny as he used to be. Um, he's, he's a dad and a mom, and he's the best father I've ever known. Um, He's always been the best father I've ever known. But taking on the role of being a mother as well for those children, there's nobody in this world that could have done it better. He will do anything for his children. 
that's audio from the take care of Maya trial that's going on right now in the 911 phone call. That's the repercussions, the cause, and the effect. That is the effect of the decision of Dr. Sally Smith to rip Maya away from her parents and her mother as she was trying to do anything she could for the welfare of her daughter. Eventually, the pain got so great for mom that she took her life. A consequence of the choice of Dr. Sally Smith. Sick of the ads? We are too. Start listening with no commercials now and get access to all of our episodes in advance of everyone else. Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to our podcast page and sign up now. True Crime Today Premium Plus. Sign up now.